to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. So far, we've made it down to verse 12. Today, we are going to begin reading in verse 10 so that we can see the flow of thought that leads up to verse 13, which is where we're going to begin our exposition today. So we're going to read through uh, a bunch of verses here, and then we're going to pray, all right? 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning to read verse 10. <clears throat> As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity that we have in this assembly to behold you in your word. Lord, we know that our relationship with you is based upon the work of the Spirit in our heart and based upon the word of God which you have given to us, your word that you've given to us. We walk by faith and not by sight. And yet the faith we have has sight. It has vision. It is able to see what you need us to see in order for us to walk intimately with you. We thank you, Lord, for the assembly. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this place, Lord, that we can gather in each week, Lord, as many times as we want. We thank you, God, for the freedom that we have in this United States of America to do this, Lord, at least at this point, without somebody kicking the doors in and taking us away. Father, we thank you for the comfort that you've provided for us, Lord, putting a roof over our heads and giving us climatized environment, Lord. Lord, we thank you for these things that we take for granted. But Lord, we understand <clears throat> that all of this is based upon your grace, based upon your goodness, Lord. And Father, we pray that you would speak to us today through your word. 
Lord, let it do that work in our hearts that we need. Sometimes we don't even know what we need. So Lord, tonight, today, Lord, this morning, give us what we need, Lord, from your word, by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Ah, yes, the creature comforts. The cool air. For some of you, too cold, right? Man, you guys keep this church so cold. It's so funny to watch everybody huddling up. <clears throat> you know what? It keeps you awake, to be honest with you. <clears throat> Wouldn't you rather be cooler than hot? And uh, I heard a lot of amens. That's good to know. I'll remember that next time I see you huddled up shivering. Don't forget, that's better, right? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, it's, I know, I know. I keep my house at 47 degrees during the day. <clears throat> I like my bedroom at about 58. <clears throat> I'm just weird that way, forgive me. <laughs> Let's back up to verse 13. Verse 13 begins with that word, therefore. Therefore. That word right there is best understood as referring to all that has been said in verses 3 through 12. One commentator said, because God has begotten you to a living hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead, because you have an incorruptible inheritance, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, that's everything we've read so far, therefore, in typical New Testament fashion, Peter constructed this ethical superstructure on the doctrinal foundation he had laid. The transforming experience of salvation and its hope of future glory should be the driving force in daily duty. But grace must first be experienced before the obligations of grace become operative, end quote. In other words, we've got to know what God did in order for do what God is telling us to do. Amen? We love him because he first loved us. It's that kind of principle. So, therefore, the first item on the list, prepare your minds for action. Now, King James Version uh, brings out the sense of this very first line better than the NASB does. The King James Version reads this way. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now that phrase right there of girding the loins is based upon the first century practice of people gathering up their loose flowing robe with a belt so that they do not trip or fall when they need to engage in various types of activity. It is obviously being applied here, not as a means of preventing restricted physical movement, but as a means of preventing one from being hindered and advancing spiritually, specifically as it relates to the mind. Jason said in his prayer something like, you know, Lord, let our brains be open. <laughs> Actually, that's, mind is really the, the, the best word to use, but I say that all the time myself. Lord, do something with my brain. And what I mean is, is my understanding, right? Not necessarily the physical brain. So here, the girding up of the loins of the mind. It is a call to bring all of one's rational and reflective powers under the control by, and I quote, cutting off vague, loosely flowing thoughts and speculations that lead nowhere and only hamper obedience, end quote. These things, whatever they are, harbored in the mind, prevent the Holy Spirit from using the mental faculties of the Christian in the most efficient manner, and thus from causing that believer to grow in the Christian life and make progress in his salvation. 
Peter actually treats this as a God-expected obligation on the part of the believer. Kenneth Wiest, and I'm going to be quoting from Kenneth Wiest a lot during this first Peter study because his commentary on the Greek New Testament is superb. <clears throat> but Kenneth Wiest said this in his commentary. He said, the Christian has the privilege of enjoying the wholesome mental atmosphere called Christian optimism and a carefree mind. Not a mind devoid of an appreciation of the seriousness of life and its responsibilities, but a mind not crippled and frozen by worry, fear, and their related mental attitudes." End quote. Now, I, I'm moving, I'm gonna move this study along a little bit for the sake of, of focusing on the other equally important things that this verse and the verses following are calling us to do. But I wanna point out that I've done a number of teachings on the subject of renewing the mind that you might be able to uh, track down on the website. If you are unable to do that, let me know and we'll find a way to get that teaching to you. I will though direct you to a very foundational verse on this subject. <clears throat> it's sort of a food for thought kind of verse, literally, and it's in Philippians 4.8, which simply says this. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell or think on these things, okay? So I'm gonna leave you with that. But we are told here to gird up the loins of our mind, gather up those loose ends <clears throat> that make us trip, that impede spiritual progress. Next we are told, verse 13 continuing, phrase by phrase, keep sober in spirit. Keep sober in spirit. Now that phrase there, keep sober, comes from a single Greek word which in its literal form means not to be intoxicated. But here, and as it's used elsewhere in the New Testament, it's obviously being, well, it's being used figuratively. You could apply it literally, but it's being used figuratively as meaning free from every form of mental and spiritual excess and confusion. It's referring to an attitude of self-discipline that avoids the extremes of the reckless irresponsibility of self-indulgence on the one hand and even of religious ecstasy on the other hand. So much for being drunk in the spirit. I've heard some Pentecostals say I was drunk in the spirit. <clears throat> falling over myself because the spirit had so overwhelmed me. No, you're not drunk in the spirit. You're in the flesh if you're drunk in the spirit is really what's going on. But here the idea, the word inculcates a, a calm, steady state of mind that evaluates things correctly so that it's not thrown off balance by new and fascinating ideas. It refers to a level headedness. And this is the constant, this is a constant need for Christians to think level headedly. Gotta have a level, level head. By the way, level headedly is a word I just made up. <laughs> I make up words all the time. It's fun to make up words. If you looked it up in a dictionary, it's probably not there. But now it's in my dictionary <laughs> of words to use. Peter actually used the same word in chapter 4, verse 7, in chapter 5, verse 8, to encourage spiritual alertness in prayer and in resisting the attacks of the devil. Christian living needs order as well as passion. We need both, order and passion. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says, so then let us not sleep as, other do, as others do, but let us be alert and sober. The word kind of goes hand in hand with the girding up of the loins of the mind, okay? The two go together. 
The last thing in verse 13 is fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the call to commitment here is balanced with a reminder of their confidence. Whatever disciplines may be necessary for the Christian life, <clears throat> God's purpose will be sufficient and nothing will thwart his ultimate purposes in them, in them and for them. And that is what Peter is saying to these believers. He's saying, fix your eyes on the Lord. Set all your hope on him and his promised return. This is, after all, the epistle of hope. And we've already noted that hope in its fullest New Testament sense is a certain expectation. So the Christian is expected to view every aspect of his life in light of Christ's second coming and everything associated with that. The revelation of Jesus Christ at that time will bring us into the full experience of all that God has prepared for us. And man, has he prepared something for us. And the promises of his grace, that is his undeserved favor, wrapped up in our salvation, will be there to be enjoyed. Again, I quote, again from Kenneth Wiest. <laughs> the words to be brought are from an article, technical words here, are from an article and a present participle in the Greek text. It is true that our reception of this grace is yet future, but the picture in the word used is of this grace being brought to us right now. That is, it is already on the way. It is on the divine menu. We have our justification the moment we put our faith in the Lord Jesus. It is ours forever. We have our, <coughs> excuse me, we are having our sanctification during our earthly life, namely the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, giving us victory over sin and producing in us his fruit as we are definitely subjected to him. We will have our glorification namely the transformation of our physical bodies at the rapture. The first two courses on the divine menu, justification and sanctification, we are enjoying now. Peter exhorts us to set our hope perfectly, wholly and unchangeably without doubt and despondency upon our future glorification. It is like eating a bountiful repast at the home of Mrs. Charming Hostess. While we are enjoying the delicious meal, we are not worrying whether there will be dessert or not. We know that it is on the menu and it is being brought to us as soon as we are ready for it. End quote. <laughs> Actually, ready or not, right? <laughs> now, these things are also emphasized. In fact, I'd like you to turn there real quick to Titus chapter 2. Just a couple of verses from Titus chapter 2. These verses are very much reminiscent of what we read in Titus. Go to the left, a few books. Titus is before Hebrews. And we're going to land in Titus 2. And we're looking, <clears throat> excuse me, at verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11 reads this way. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's what we're being told in 1 Peter right now. Here's what we're also being told. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. 
Let no one disregard you. So you see that? Grace of God brings salvation, instructs us. Grace is a teacher of holiness, instructing us to deny ungodliness, live sensibly, righteously, godly in the present age, looking for, looking out for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. By the way, verse 13 is a great verse for the deity of Christ. If you're ever witnessing to anybody, there's a whole grammatical rule there. <clears throat> I can talk to you about it afterwards if you're interested. But you see what it's saying, it's saying there. And think about 1 Thessalonians. You can turn back to 1 Peter. Think about 1 Thessalonians 1.8. I'll read this to you. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul writing to them wrote, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you. I love this. And how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Isn't that great? You turned from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Oh, thank you, Lord. And by the way, one more aspect of this. Let us not fail to remember an essential aspect of our future hope is the redemption of our physical bodies. That is something that is pronounced throughout the New Testament, notably in Romans 8.22. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Oh, man, we groan. Oh, man, I don't feel good. Oh, my poor body waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our body. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're waiting for him to pop through the clouds, right, so to speak. Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. That's part of the hope that we have is the redemption of our bodies. We're given bodies that are fitted to live out the rest of eternity bodies that are fitted in a particular way. I don't know how the Lord is going to do it exactly. <clears throat> Especially when you have bodies that are laying in a grave somewhere, body that died falling to the bottom of the ocean somewhere. Nevertheless, that's not going to stop or hinder the power of God from raising up every body. By the way, those that are lost are being raised up too. Everybody, everybody's going to get raised up it's just a question of where the body will spend eternity. Because the bodies that will spend eternity separated from God will be fitted for destruction, it says in Romans. That's a horrifying thought. But for the believer, the apostle says our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly wait for the Savior. We're looking for that who's going to transform the body of our humble state. And that's what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. The whole chapter is about the resurrection of our bodies using the resurrection of Christ's body as an example, as a pattern of what we can expect. But it doesn't stop there. The sentence continues. Verse 14. As obedient children. Now that's an easy phrase to just read right over as obedient children. You know me, I'm not gonna just read over it real quick. <laughs> we gotta cover this, man. As obedient children, those who cultivate Christian hope must also cultivate personal holiness. 
Hope in a coming Savior demands conformity to his nature. That phrase there, as obedient children, is more than a complimentary recognition of the reader's conduct. It indicates that the call to holiness is grounded in their very nature as recipients of the new birth. That single word, the word as, indicates the filial nature of those to whom Peter wrote. It has the force of saying, inasmuch as you are children of God. Their personal experience of the new birth gave them the ability and the inner impulse to obey the demands of holiness. The words as obedience or as obedient denotes that the constitution and character of these children, which is impressed upon them from their very spiritual birth, belongs to their very nature. In other words, we are as obedient children refers to the fact that we are children. The Lord has adopted us and the Lord has made us his own. Obedience indicates their character as true believers. It's the motivating principle that's imparted in regeneration when God changes us. Their nature, our nature, as children of obedience, distinguishes us from the unsaved who are called the sons of disobedience. It's part of their nature. They're just acting out who they are, what they are. And so, as the Lord rebirths, brings spiritual rebirth to our lives, we're acting out what we are, who we are. And as his children... The next part of verse 14 says, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. So the emphasis of verse 14, excuse me, helps us to see that this conformity does not begin with outward actions as much as it begins with with our attitude, our mindset, our character. Peter is referring to a conformity of thought and purpose. And what God requires in us is a total change of purpose, of who we are. Our outward life will only change as there is a natural outworking of an inner change. That's how outwardly we will change. Because inwardly something has happened. Worldly conformity is a lack of obedience that adopts the attitudes, the mindsets, and even the purposes of the culture of which we are a part. And this type of conformity belongs, as it says here, to the time of ignorance when we did not know Christ and so we lived like the world lives. One of the prevailing attitudes of our culture is I don't, I don't, want any problems, I don't want any pain, I don't deserve to experience the difficulties or the trauma that I experience in in any measure. And as believers, we are not to adopt that mindset. We are to conform to the example of Christ and Jesus said, hey, in this world you're gonna suffer. He warned us of that. The flesh just repulses at the idea of that. But the spirit, even though our flesh may say, no, I don't really want that, but the spirit says, no. The Lord says, no, I want that for you. It's just the polar opposite of the way the world thinks. Now, the word for ignorance here is actually a very important New Testament concept. Ephesians 4.18 vividly relates how ignorance regarding God pertains not to mental perception, but to a willful ignorance of him. So in this sense, Ignorance is tantamount to disobedience. Ephesians says that they were darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So ignorance is actually a condition apart from Christ 
and it characterizes one's past life in sin and disobedience. See, the idea in the New Testament, the idea of ignorance cannot be equated with innocence or guiltlessness. Ignorance is, in fact, a form of rebellion. <clears throat> and this is actually a very common theme in New Testament exhortations, which instruct us not to get swept up in the spirit and behavior that formally characterized us. In fact, Ephesians 2, I'll read this to you real quick, <clears throat> unless you want to turn there, but I'll just read it to you. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you, we... <clears throat> We're dead in our trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest." So there's that idea. In ignorance, we were actually living in open rebellion to God. We may not have been fully aware of how much we were living in rebellion, but it was willful. We wanted to do it. It was our desire to do. And we were accountable to God because of it. Amazing. <clears throat> now the second part of verse 15 here... <clears throat> actually carries a very similar idea as Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's very similar to that. It's also very similar to Ephesians 4, 22, which says this, 4, 22 through 24 that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. <clears throat> now, if you happen to be saved at a young age, there is still a sinful ignorance to shun even if you were not fully partaking at an earlier time in your life, fully partaking in a life of sin, you should just consider yourself spared from that. Now you have a responsibility to avoid walking in the darkness that you didn't, maybe that you didn't fully partake of previously. But you certainly could now, and you're being told in the word of God not to do that. Some of us lived lives of Christ, or lived longer lives outside of Christ than others. And we have more of a past perhaps to be influenced by. And so there's always that warning in scripture not to be influenced by that. And by the way, something that I just want to mention as sort of a side note, <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're talking about here uh, how it is that we as, as children of redemption should walk to please God, right? Well, there is this idea that following Jesus means that I'm going to be more attractive to the lost, to the world. There's a strange notion by some that being like Jesus means at least some level of conformity to the world. I mean, just look at how Jesus was welcomed by sinners, and so consequently, there can be a grave misunderstanding of what being a good witness means. The standard of obedience for the Christian comes from the Bible. Being pleasing to God is the central reason for our existence as believers. This is what believers want, God's approval. If there is a positive response from the ungodly, toward the believer, toward the church, it will be because of the church's conformity to the standard of scripture. In other words, being Christ-like. 
The ungodly knew that there was a difference between Jesus and the religious leaders, not because Jesus was so much like the godless, because he wasn't. Jesus was the very embodiment of the truth, and they recognized that. And they also recognized that he loved them. See, that's the difference. That's why some people responded to him the way that they did. But we will never be a better witness to the lost by going out and pounding down some beers with our unsaved friends or chiming in on the coarse jesting around the coffee pot in the break room at work. Conformity to the world, conformity to their lusts, their fears, their anxieties, their bad habits is the worst way to be a witness for Christ. God may lead us into hell's kitchen to evangelize, but we cannot partake of the excess. That's not what God ever calls us to do. We are children of our heavenly Father. Next two verses, we'll cover these and then we'll wrap it up. <clears throat> but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So instead of capitulating to the realm of the godless, believers are called to live holy lives. The pattern for holiness is God himself, who, as the scripture declares, is unremittingly good. The call to goodness is one of the distinctive emphasis in 1 Peter. Of course, the root meaning of the word holiness could be expressed as different or distinct, set apart. But the word holy there describes a qualitative difference. The holiness of their lives is to match that of God who called them to himself. It says he called them. And this calling here refers to the effectual call in which he infallibly brings people to himself. And this definition is borne out <clears throat> by what we see in chapter two, we'll see later on, chapter two, verse nine, where God calls people out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So calling here does not merely mean that he invites, but it also conveys the idea of God's power in bringing people from darkness to light. And just as God creates, or God's call creates light where there is no darkness, where there was no darkness, so he creates life when there was death. And so the reference to calling here is very important for again, Grace precedes demand. All holiness stems from God who called them, who calls us into the sphere of the holy. And so the command to be holy indica indicates that on our sojourning, the pilgrim people of God, that we are to live differently. We are to separate ourselves from the evil desires of the world and live in a way that pleases God because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And here Peter reaches back into the Old Testament for proof that God expects his people to be like himself. In Leviticus 11:44, the Lord said, be holy, he said to his people, be holy for I am holy. Christians, of course, are empowered to live holy lives by the indwelling spirit. Holiness produces in our lives a loving conformity to God's commands, which ultimately produces the character of God in us. To live a holy life is simply to be like God is, to want to be like God is. Don't take that clip of what I just said and post it and said, Dave just said we're like God. We are gods. I am not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying we are being called to be holy as God is holy. 
We're trying to be imitators of him, right? We look at his character, we see the character of Christ, and we want to emulate, we want to imitate that. We want to be exactly as he is. And we can be assured of this. Jesus was altogether different from the sinners that he ministered to. Going back to what I said earlier. Not conform, there's no conformity there. There's Jesus being a light in a dark place and the darkness recognizing that's real light. That's the truth. They looked at the Pharisees and recognized that ain't. I, I think ain't is in the dictionary now, by the way. We used to say that when we were young. Ain't isn't a word, you know. Well, I think it is now. I think it's actually in the dictionary. <clears throat> And I like to use that word because sometimes it's great for effect, isn't it? Ain't it? So, <clears throat> holiness is something that God demands because he is that way. So, this sentence actually continues on and we're going to unpack more of this, Lord willing, in our next session together. But hopefully we can see <clears throat> the call here of preparing our minds for action and keeping sober in spirit and fixing our hope completely on the grace of God to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And yes, by all means, obedient children, not conformed to this world, not conformed to former lusts that we did in our ignorance, but just like the Holy One who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, we are told to be holy ourselves and all of our behavior, behavior. <clears throat> what characterizes our lives? That's a great question for us to ponder significantly. What characterizes my life? What do I love? What do I like to do? Amen? Let's stand. Am I moving too fast? I'm sort of kidding because I don't think we're covering that many verses each week. But <clears throat> phrase by phrase, um, <laughs> I was telling my wife on the way to church today, it, it's, hard, it's hard not to cover it, cover this slowly because every phrase is packed. I thought about doing a whole topical sermon on girding up the loins of the mind, and I decided not to. <clears throat> um, not because I necessarily think it's problematic to park somewhere for a long time, but I don't want to miss, I don't want to focus so much on the individual leaves that we lose sight of the trees of the forest. So I try not to do that, even though it's hard not to focus in, to zero in so that we have an understanding of what it is the text is saying to us. And uh, I, I want to be able to um, rightly divide the word of truth. And so that's always what I at least attempt to do. So <clears throat> we know our responsibility based on what the text has informed us today. So hopefully may we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. And Father in heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord, that you are indeed our heavenly father and lord we are your offspring <clears throat> by adoption you own us lord we were bought with a price our bodies are yours and even if we're not in christ today if there's anyone here who is not that body still belongs to you and you're going to do with it what you see fit when we die. Lord, you created us for the ultimate purpose of having a relationship with you and serving you. And Lord, for those of us who have been renewed in our hearts, it really is our pleasure to serve you, Lord. We consider it the highest honor to bow at your feet because you are a great king over all the earth. And we want to surrender to your lordship in our lives. 
And Lord, we don't want to just make you a part of our lives. Lord, we want your life. We want to be dominated by the life, by your life, God. No co-pilot, Lord. You are the pilot. You steer everything. And we just want to conform, be conformed to your image, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys.